The following is a lecture given by His Holiness Jaya Bhattaka Swami on December 30th, 1984. The class begins with a reading from the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Maja Leela, Chapter 19, Verse 1 through 5. Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadharo Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Brinda Brindavani Yangarasa Keli Vartang Kalena Luptang Nija Shakti Nukta Sanchajaru Pevyatanot Punasa Prabhu Vidhav Pragi Valoka Shristim Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Chapter 19, Text 1, Translation Before the creation of this cosmic manifestation, the Lord enlightens the heart of Lord Brahma with the details of the creation and manifested the Vedic knowledge. In exactly the same way, the Lord being anxious to revive the Vrindavana pastimes of Lord Krishna impregnated the heart of Rupa Goswami with spiritual potency. By this potency, Srila Rupa Goswami could revive the activities of Krishna in Vrindavana, activities almost lost to memory. In this way, he spread Krishna consciousness throughout the world. Jayo Jayo Sri Chaitanya Jayo Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gora Bhakta Brinda Jayo Jayo Sri Chaitanya Jayo Nityananda Jaya Daita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Brinda All glories to Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu All glories to Lord Nityananda All glories to Advaita Chandra All glories to all the devotees of the Lord Sri Rupa Sanatana Rohe Rama Keli Grami Prabhure Milia Gela Apona Bhavani. After meeting Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the village of Ramakeli, the brothers Rupa and Sanatana returned to their homes. Dui Vaya Vishoy Tyage Rupai Ustri Jolo Bahudana Diya Dui Brahmane Dhobhodilo. Dui Bai Vishoya Tage Rupaya Sri Jilo Bahudana Diya Dui Brahmane Bhorilo Translation The two brothers devised the means whereby they could give up their material activities. For this purpose they appointed two Brahmanas and paid them a large amount of money. Krishna Mantri Korailo Dui Purush Charan Achirata Paibari Chaitana Charan The Brahmanas performed religious ceremonies and chanted the holy name of Krishna so that the two brothers might attain shelter at the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very soon. Purport by Srila Prabhupada A Purush Charana is a ritualistic ceremony performed under the guidance of an expert spiritual master or a brahmana. It is performed for the fulfillment of certain desires. One rises early in the morning, chants the Hare Krishna mantra, performs archana by the arati ceremony, and worships the deities. These activities are described in the 15th chapter, verse 108. The Vaishnav encyclopedia of uh, spiritual practices which we're compiling has a section on this uh, Puras Charana ceremonies which Krihastas are supposed to perform at different uh, times during the progress of their Grihasta activities 
and at different times during the development of a child. Of course, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and performing worship to Vishnu is the basic system. But that one uh, does so with a specific intention of uh, some spiritual objective. This shouldn't be confused with uh, some ritualistic activity which is performed for some uh, material pers- uh, some material fruitive desire or for uh, other type of uh, non-devotional desires. But these are performed by Vaishnavas with the purpose of uh, helping one to advance in the process of Krishna consciousness. The introductory or the invocational verse, which is at the beginning of every chapter of the Chaitanya Charitamrita's special Sanskrit uh, verse, composed by Krishna Das Kaviraj, which gives the essence of uh, that particular chapter. And in this verse of this 19th chapter, he reveals the inner secret behind Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's relationship with Srila Rupa Goswami. He also is revealing what is the actual purpose to Srila Rupa Goswami's activities. That not only did Lord Chaitanya did Lord Chaitanya come simply for delivering the fallen souls from birth and death, but his inner secret was to recreate the pastimes of Vrindavana to keep that specific process of devotional service alive in the world. Due to the influence of Kali Yuga, that principle of devotional service as it was practiced in Vrindavana had become almost lost. So especially the two brothers, Rupa and Sanatana, had both been instructed in different ways to establish the system of worshipping Krishna as it was performed by the residents of Vrindavan. This is very important because this is a very esoteric, a very inner secret of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. That the process of chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, is performed not in the ritualistic sense by the followers of Lord Chaitanya. Neither do the followers of Lord Chaitanya chant Hare Krishna simply for liberation. But they are chanting in the mood of the residents of Vrindavana. Lord Chaitanya said that of all the devotees of the Lord, you see, in the spiritual world, in heaven, on earth, everywhere, of all of the devotees, that those devotees of Vrindavan, the place where Krishna performed his childhood pastimes as a son, cowherd son of Mother uh, Yasoda and Nanda Maharaj, that that particular mood of devotional service that those Brajavasis or residents of Vrindavan performed was so exquisite, was so wonderful, that it is incomparable, is the best. So Krishna, when he's come as a devotee, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his inner purpose, he wants to keep that pure type of devotional service alive in the world and to rather bring more and more people into that, uh, into those Vrindavan pastimes. So bringing newer and newer uh, devotees, more devotees to worship Krishna, that type of mood 
of trying to satisfy Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's desire for expanding Krishna's pastimes, this is not a material desire. We shouldn't confuse it with something material. That Rupa Goswami explained that something which is beneficial for the devotional service of the Lord should never be rejected by taking it to be material. Here at Rupa and Sanatan they had money, but they used their money to try to see how they could reach Krishna. This is the actual purpose if someone has any material facility, they should think how to use this facility in such a way that ultimately I can achieve the lotus feet of Krishna. Otherwise, having wealth becomes just like putting, what they say, concrete uh, necktie on and going for a swim. You sink. Right? Even, I believe, uh, the Christian... Uh, the Bible says something like it's harder for an elephant to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go back to Godhead or something like that. Uh, of course, if you don't know pure devotional service, if a person is a pure devotee, like the residents of Vrindavana, for them their only property is Krishna. They have nothing else. Whatever they have, they consider to be Krishna's and they consider their real property that is Krishna. That they are Krishna's and Krishna is theirs. This type of intimate relationship is especially seen in Vrindavana, where the devotee totally surrenders to Krishna, I am yours, and they feel that Krishna is theirs. And Krishna, in fact, he becomes purchased by their pure love and devotion. Just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he told Srivas, who had that mood of uh, pure devotion, he said that, Srivas, if you want to, you can take me in the market and sell me. And he said, let all the devotees know that I belong to Srivas. He can do whatever he wants with me. If he wants to put me up for sale, he can do that. Because I totally belong to him. He has purchased me with his pure devotion. So in this way, we should understand that by giving their thoughts, their words, their deeds, their heart, everything to Krishna, the residence of Vrindavan, in exchange, Krishna gave himself. And he said that very humbly, very apologetically, that I am very sorry that I don't have anything worthy of giving you in repayment for your love. I have nothing suitable, you see. He didn't consider even giving himself as being adequate repayment for the love they gave him. That is Krishna's wonderful characteristic. So instead he's apologizing. You have to be satisfied with me, you see, and with your pure love. Because I have nothing else that I can give you. So, Krishna actually became so indebted. But the devotees, they don't think like that. The devotees are always thinking how I can please Krishna more and more. You see, in this way there's a competition who can please Krishna most. So here are the brothers, we can know from these verses that their secret purpose, that Lord Chaitanya's plan for them, is through them he wanted to reestablish what is the worship of Krishna and Vrindavan, that mood, that essence, that he wanted to preserve in the world. That is the ecstatic principle. You see, because those Vrindavan pastimes are totally... Uh, under the dominion of Srimati Radharani. Just as Krishna is the Ishwara, Brajeshwar, the master of Vrindavan, the Brajeshwari, is uh, Srimati Radharani. And she's arranging all the uh, services to Lord Krishna in such a way that 
uh, Krishna may be satisfied through that devotional service. So, in this way, Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is bringing into the world this uh, understanding of Radha Krishna worship, understanding of pure devotion in the mood of Vrindavana. You see, now, this be understood that there are other moods, just like the mood of worshipping Ramachandra in Ayodhya as the greatest king, as the Raghupati Raghava Raja Ram. There's a particular mood. When you go, if you go to Ayodhya in India, and you, you get this, uh, there's a particular flavor to that worship. Even when you hear the songs, you know, Jaya Sita Ram, Jaya Hanuman, Raghupati Raghava Raja Ram, Patita Bhavana Sita Ram. There's, a, there's a, a certain flavor to that in your either pastime. Now that's the specific mood of devotion of the devotees there, which is filled with a servitude, type of reserved friendship. Yet the Lord is very protecting and He has those particular qualities. And the Lord's personal relationship or deep love for His consort Sita, that gives a little bit of an insight into some of the more intimate pastimes. But it was, you see, not, he was not so available, he's not so approachable. Because he is a king, if you want to approach the president, you have to go a little bit in a reserved way. Some distance is there. Of course, he was more approachable than Narayana. He came down to the forest and he was with his monkey friends and like that. Definitely he's more approachable. He's as a king in the world, so he's that type of Vedic king. Anyone can approach him, but a particular mood. But Krishna in Vrindavan as a cowherd boy, he was the most approachable. That's why uh, Kunti Devi, when she prays uh, to Krishna, she uh, prays uh, Nanda Kumara, huh? calls him as the uh, the Gopa, Nanda Gopa Kumara, Kamara Sia, there's one sloka there in Bhagavatam. She prays to him that uh, you are the cowherd boy, the son of Mother Nanda. In other words, you're very approachable. It's very easy to come to you because you're already simple like a cowherd boy. You know, in the city when you try to preach, people are generally very cold. You go out in the country a little bit, they, wo they warm up a little bit. They're not... You might have experienced that even here in America. In India, it's very much uh, uh, preserved, that type of warmth in the village. You see, if you go in someone's village, the, the person will empty his whole house out and say, please come and stay in my house, stay in the room here. And you come in, it's uh, you feel embarrassed that they'll leave their master bedroom and say, you know, you're the guest, you have to stay here. You t take uh, meals. They won't eat until after uh, you've all all the guests have been fed. You see, when even now in India, sometimes in the cities, you don't always get uh, as uh, spontaneous. Well, of course, it's still there in India, but uh, you can see in the villages, it's there much more. So there, Krishna, he was as a cowherd boy in Vrindavana. So he was very approachable. He is very. Uh, compassionate like that. So even uh, Kunti Devi, although she's his auntie from his uh, relation as uh, with uh, Devaki and Vasudeva, she's addressing him as the son of the darling of Nanda Maharaj, trying to get his, uh, his uh, more compassionate side to please uh, be very favorably disposed to what I'm about to say, to my request to you. Remember, you're the cowherd boy, you're very approachable, very easy. So that mood of Vrindavan worship is not based on a very formal relationship as we find to some extent in Lord Rama's uh, pastime, but not so much. But especially we find totally in the worship of Lakshmi and Narayana. It's a very formal worship, you see, which is an awe and reverence and appreciation of the glory and majesty and opulences and the power of uh, the Lord. But uh, in the past times of Vrindavan, 
the appreciation more of the Lord's own personal beauty, his characteristics, his qualities, his pastimes, his name, his form, all the uh, dealings of the Lord, these are the focal point and the devotees, uh, they worship the Lord with their enthusiasm, with their pure devotion, with their dedication, and uh, with their selfless uh, love offered to the lotus feet of the Lord. And uh, awe and reverence doesn't play uh, a really, doesn't play much uh, a part of those uh, past, doesn't play any part at all in relationship to Krishna. It's a very intimate. So these pastimes were to be perpetuated by Rupa and Sanat and we should realize and how important they are that they've been given the actual most secret and inner desire of Lord Chaitanya has been given to these two brothers to preserve and to expand in the world. So therefore when we approach Lord Chaitanya, we want to approach Radha Krishna worship we go through the six Goswamis because they hold the key. They've been given the right by Lord Chaitanya to give that uh, understanding and that worship. So we approach Vrindavana and we approach the worship of uh, Radha and Krishna. Our, we approach our own process, practice of Krishna consciousness through the instructions and teachings of Sri Rupa and Sanatana Goswamis and other six Goswamis who are following and assisting them. Shri Rupa Gosai Tobe Nokate Bhoriya Aponara Gore Aila Bahudana Loya At this time, Sri Rupa Goswami returned home, taking with him large quantities of riches loaded in boats. Brahmana Vaishnava Dila Taradho Dhani Akachati Dhana Dila Kutumba Bhorani Srila Rupa Goswami divided the wealth that he brought back home. He gave 50% in charity to Brahmanas and Vaishnavas and 25% to his relatives. Purport. This is a practical example of how one should divide his money and retire from household life. 50% of one's money should be distributed to qualified and pure devotees of the Lord. 25% may be given to family members and 25% may be kept for personal use in case of emergency. So, this uh, you can see how much Rusila Rupa Goswami is a standard. Sanatan Goswami, the six Goswamis are standards for our devotional service. Even as a Grihasta, when he uh, retired, so he divided his money in this way, 50%, 25%, and 25%. And this has become the standard also in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. The Srila Prabhupada said that if somebody strictly follows by this principle, then practically speaking, they are economically on the same level as the sannyasi. That they are you combine that with, of course, the other devotional practices and they become like a grihasta brahmachari. They become totally uh, above the laws of karma. This is very important because we don't want to get jai nitai gaur, jai jagannath subhadra balarama ki. We don't want to go so far in devotional service dedicating our life to the service of Guru and Krishna and then to become entangled within fruitive activities and somehow be waylaid from going back to home, back to Godhead from achieving pure devotional service. So this, actually this is not much if you consider that uh, in developing nations Sometimes they charge 90% income tax, 70% income tax. Even in America, I think on the upper levels, it's 70%. So here it's 50%, you see. But that's not uh, just being... That even they're said that uh, they give to qualified and pure devotees of the Lord for the purpose of Krishna consciousness. 
25% for family members and 25% in case of emergency. I mean, the Grihasta should have some, uh, can have some, in any case, some emergency fund. If he's uh, an earning Grihasta, then they can have some emergency fund. You see. Of course, Rupa and Sanatan were acting as Kshatriyas in a sense because they were ministers in the government. Although they were born in Brahmana families, but they were acting as ministers. Therefore, when they did the pujas and other things, they brought in a Brahmana because they were considering... Obviously that, well, they were not acting as brahmanas in society, someone who is acting as a brahmana. Although they were, in a higher sense, Lord Chaitanya accepted them as pure Vaishnavas, as more exalted than a brahmana. But for their spiritual practices, uh, they would bring in some brahmanas, because they were mainly engaged at that time in their uh, administration, and naturally as administrators, they were making some money. You see, someone's a prime minister... You get money. It's a <clears throat> lucrative occupation. Even in those days, even today. You see, of course, what normally these polit a politician does when they get money is they just use it for their own sense gratification. But here, Rupa and Sanatana, they, you know, someone may say anything. They may say they're very devoted and everything, but the practical thing, what do you do with your money? You see, some money is very dear. It's just like one's life. When the money goes, they definitely people feel that. So what do they do if they're giving the money to Krishna? That means that their heart is even entertainment. Someone might be a professional tennis player or something. You see, it's, nowadays it's all a business. You see, it's not uh, even a, for a professional tennis player, you can't call it a frivolous sport. Although tennis... It's a frivolous sport, but if you're making hundreds of millions of hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, then well, it's an entertainment. So if they use that money for Krishna, then uh, people are foolish enough to give money to see someone beat a ball around on a over a net, you see. And if they're willing to uh, give you the money for doing that, and if you use it for Krishna, well, then uh, it's dovetailed. It's something which uh, has a, as a purpose. Prabhupada didn't uh, tell uh, George Harrison or others to give up their profession as musicians. That would be artificial. But to rather use their abilities uh, somehow or another to expand the Krishna conscious movement to serve Krishna. So here Rupa Goswami, he's showing practically putting his uh, energy, his money, where his affection is, where his uh, devotion lies. Danda bandha lagi cheti sanchoi kodila bhalo bhalo viprastane stapo grakila Danda bandha lagi choti sanchoi kodila bhalo bhalo viprastane stapo grakila he kept one-fourth of his wealth with a respectable brahmana. He kept this for his personal safety because he was expecting some legal complications. He knew there would be trouble when he left the emperor. But just see, in those days, there wasn't, even there's not banks, but he kept his wealth with a respectable brahmana. Because the brahmana is someone who's honest, so... Someone's a respectable Brahmana, you could trust in them, at least in those days. Respectable Brahmana meant that he was a respectable Brahmana, not a so-called Brahmana. So a real Brahmana you can trust. In fact, even the Mohammedan rulers in India, during the time of the Mughal rule, they would normally keep as their ministers and as their landlords, they would keep Hindus. That's why there's, because they couldn't trust their own Mohammedans. <laughs> because the nature of, uh, historically, the Mohammedans, if they get any power, they'd make a power base and then do a revolt and try to, even they'd kill their own father. It happened many times. So, <clears throat> they normally, they, they would keep, uh, the power personally directly under them and they would, they could trust the, they'd appoint Brahmanas as the landlords or, 
and then have them do the tax collecting and everything, and then they'd back him up with the central army. But then that way they found that, uh, that's why in India there wasn't, as except for a few of the more fanatical Mughal rulers, there wasn't a widespread conversion. Because uh, once you converted them into Muslims, they became more difficult to handle. <laughs> they became more wild because whatever good qualities they had, you know, many of them would go as they became meat eaters and uh, violent and everything. So it was only in the end they became a little fanatical, but uh, even uh, at the end there's only about 20% were converted. Plus the people wouldn't also convert. They didn't want to uh, change their <coughs> religion. could only be done by force. But uh, anyway, it's a historical fact that uh, they did put their trust and uh, when the British uh, conquered India and other things like that, it was always the Mohammedan general who would betray the king in many of these cases and uh, they can be they could be bought off because uh, for some reason they're a little more materialistic uh, they don't have that uh, same I don't want to say anything offensive but just historically that we've seen that they're a little bit uh, <clears throat> lacking uh, as much of a uh, type of Brahminical culture in their particular philosophy so it's not unusual here that someone would put their uh, faith in a respectable Brahmana. Even the Mohammedans did that. They're more reliable. So if people become very Brahminically qualified in the Krishna conscious movement, then they'll become more and more reliable. And the more that they're uncultured, naturally, then you cannot depend upon them. So that's why it's very important to promote the Brahminical culture by pure living, pure habits, by devotional service, then one becomes very respectable and very reliable. Go in any religion, that person who is a devotee of the Lord, he's definitely going to be more dependable than someone who is a non-devotee. Gode rakhilo mudra dasa hajare Sanatana bhyai kore rakhe mudra gore he deposited 10,000 coins which he later sp was, were later spent by Srila Shanatan Goswami in the custody of a local Bengali grocer. Sri Rupa Shunilo Prabhu Niladri Gaman Bonapote Jabin Prabhu Sri Brindavan Sri Rupa Goswami heard that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had returned to Jagannath Puri and was preparing to go to Vrindavana through the forest. Rupa Gosai Nila Chole Patai Lodui Jan Prabhu Jabe Brindavana Kore Nagama Sri Rupa Goswami sent two people to Jagannath Puri to find out when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would depart for Vrindavana. Sigra Simoreta Diva Samachar Suniya Tanura Rupa Kori Bobiaboha Sri Rupa Goswami told the two men you are to return quickly and let me know when he will depart. Then I shall make the proper arrangements. Eta sonatona goshai bhave mone mon Raja more priti kore se mora bandhan While Sanatana Goswami was at Gauda Desha, he was thinking, the Nawab is very pleased with me. I certainly have an obligation. Kono mote raja jodi more krudho hoy, tobe abya hoti hoya kori lo nishoy. Somehow or other, if the Nawab becomes angry with me, I shall be greatly relieved. That is my conclusion. Ashashtera choddo kori, rohe nijogore, raja kaja charila na jaya raja dare. On the pretext of bad health, Sanatan Goswami remained home. Thus he gave up government service and did not go to the royal court. Lobhi kayasta gana raja kaja kore apone swagrihe kore shastira bichare. 
the greedy masters of his clerical and secretarial staff performed the governmental duties, while Sanatan personally remained home and discussed revealed scriptures. Purport. Sanatan Goswami was the minister in charge of the government secretariat, and his assistants, the undersecretaries and clerks, all belonged to the Kayasta community. Formerly the Kayastas belonged to the clerical and secretarial staff of the government, and later if one served in such a post, he was called a Kayasta. Eventually, if a person could not identify himself as a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, or Sudra, he used to introduce himself as a Kayasta to get a wealthy and honorable position. In Bengal, it is said that if one cannot give the identity of his caste, he calls himself a Kayasta. On the whole, the Kayasta community is a mixture of all castes, and it is especially includes those engaged in clerical or secretarial work. Materially, such people are always busy occupying responsible government posts. When Sanatana Goswami was relaxing and feeling inclined to retire from government service, many Kayastas on his secretarial staff were very eager to occupy his post. In this regard, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur states that when Sanatana Goswami was a government minister and the Kayastas who assisted him saw that he was reluctant to continue, they became very expert in their duties. Sanatana Goswami was a Brahmana belonging to the Saraswat Brahmana community. It is said that when he resigned, an underworker named Purandara Khan, who was a Kayasta, occupied his post. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sya Dvaita Gadarhar Shiva Sri Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Any question? Yes, Narottam? No, oh, even in Vrindavan they have a big temple, but that's also Lord Chaitanya said to build temples. But the worship of Krishna in Vrindavan is different than the worship of, say, Lakshmi Narayana in South India. In Vrindavan, the beautiful dresses and arti and kirtan and I mean, Hanartam. He's being a pujari who studied the different types of worship. I mean, it's a totally different... Uh, <clears throat> of course, we worship in the mood of Lakshmi Narayan taking ourselves to be not on that level as a Brajavasi or as a resident of Vrindavan. But uh, their uh, worship of uh, deities didn't become any less... Uh, uh, in the mood of uh, Vrindavana by build, putting them in a temple. You see, that depends upon the devotee, the worshipper, and his attitude of surrender and dedication. Just like Srila Prabhupada uh, in Vrindavan, he wanted to establish uh, the worship in our Krishna Balaram temple. And so, <clears throat> he, he wanted not just to have the things done at a specific time and everything. I mean, that was always always there in every temple. But I remember the first thing he told the pujari that he, he said that, I don't want you to ever leave the temple. I don't want you to go down to the marketplace. I want you, you know, except for some emergency or some, you know, specific thing. But basically, I want you to like dedicate your life to the deities. And the devotee heard that. He was on the next plane and flew back to America. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> you see, the point was that those uh, Goswamis, naturally you want to increase your devotional, uh, you know, nice facility for Krishna. So if someone offers a temple, they don't refuse. So they're very glad to see Krishna worship very nicely. But uh, their total dedication... To and uh, 
to worshiping the deity, that wasn't in any way affected because they put the deity in a temple. You shouldn't think that we have to worship Krishna on the, under a tree. We can't worship him in a temple. The point is that they're worshiping Krishna even if they don't have a temple. Normally we think, how can I worship Krishna if I don't have a car, I don't have a temple, I don't have this, I don't have that. We have so many conditions to our story. They don't have anything. They're sitting under a tree. They're worshiping Krishna. Does that mean if you offer them a temple and nice uh, facilities to put Krishna in, that that will somehow affect or be a negative aspect of their, in their devotional service? No. All right. We don't accept. But the way that we do artis, or the way that uh, the different pujas and ceremonies, anakut, julan, these are all Vrindavan worship. You see, you don't normally see Narayana on a julan, but you see Radha Krishna on a julan. You see, there's a Govardhan, Gonakut, the swing festival, swing, it's a swing festival, or Govardhan puja where you make the mountain of rice, Worshipping that called Gopashtami, then Ras Lila, and uh, Janavastami festival, and Radhastami festival, and then in the spring, the Balaram's Ras Lila, and so many festivals like that, Basanta Puja. These are all uh, Vrindavan oriented, you see. So Krishna Chaitanya wanted that uh, that worship would be. You see, Vrindavan is described in the 10th canto as the Nitya Utsavam. It's a daily festival. So if you have a temple, it's, nice, it's easier to have a festival than if you're under a tree. But they're even having their worship under even when they don't have a festival. That's the remarkable thing, without any facility. We should have that type of dedication that, you know, even if it becomes the day after, <laughs> that we're going to go on with our devotional service, you see. We may be sitting in a, you know, Krishna forbid, in any circumstance, you see. So we should be determined no matter what that we're going to do our devotional service. But if some rich person says, oh, I want to build you, build Krishna a nice temple, oh, that doesn't... Uh, they not, the temple's not for... They may still live under the tree, but the temple's for the Lord. But because we're not at that same pure level, they talk to their deities, deities talk to them sometimes, different things, are, you see. We don't uh, artificially put ourselves on that level. So we are very careful about all the rules and regulations because that's also the system given. We shouldn't feel ourselves to be a very intimate, uh, you see, just uh, so confidential that we uh, artificially do something uh, whimsical. But we should, first of all, thoroughly know what are the regulatory principles of devotional service. And if one uh, is actually able to understand the Lord's you know, on that level, they could understand what the Lord wanted. So, Krishna is Himself. And for a preaching purpose, you see, for oneself, you can worship under a tree, but Prabhupada told us that in Mayapur, that he was sitting in the grass hut. I said, this grass hut with the bamboo uh, uh, eaves, you know, the, what do you call those, trusses and the roof and uh, all the grass... Uh, Roofing, little grass huts, you know, they have little mice crawling. But they're not like rats or something, they're quite friendly and a few lizards are there and you can always, I mean, you're quite close to nature. <laughs> and when you're living in a couple of tons of grass, there's all type of action going on there. But uh, it's very organic, it's very nice, it's a wonderful vibration. Very simple, you see, you don't have, uh, it's very warm. In the ha in the cold weather, because it's good insulation, and it's quite cool in the hot weather. Sometimes, uh, if you're like in Delhi, it's a very hot place, and there in the uh, concrete buildings, even the walls you touch, they become they're hot. You turn a fan on, it's like a blast furnace. There's no protection. There's no it's Albuquerque, New Mexico, place like that. It's almost the same. They have to pump in those air coolers to cool down the air. But in the grass roof, you see, it doesn't get hot, so the room t stays cool, relatively speaking. So anyway, that's all other things. So Prabhupada was just basically saying that here we're staying in this simple grass hut, 
This is sattvic. This is in the mode of goodness. This is ideal for worshipping Krishna, for chanting and worshipping Krishna. At that time we had a little Radhamadav. We had Radhamadav deity and we worshipped in the grass hut. Then we got another little better temple. Then now we moved to the present temple. Now we're building another temple for the Lord. Ships. Uh, because it may take another 10 years for the big temple to be completed. So we don't want them just to stay in the ground floor so many years. So Vishnupad and some devotees, they got some donations together and they're building uh, another temple now for Radhamada, which should be ready before 1986, along with the Samadhi. The foundations are already up above ground level. Another guest house is also being constructed by donations from Australia and from some devotees in Calcutta. And some different zones are buying rooms so that when they go to Mayapur, they'll have their own rooms to stay. But, uh, getting off the point. Oh, so Prabhupada is saying that this is sattvic. This is uh, in the mode of goodness, this uh, grass hut. And then he pointed over, that time we were constructing the present temple. And uh, he said that construction is in the mode of passion. If you've ever seen the modern concrete construction, you have to have vibrators. Da -da 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 -da. And you know, it's a whole passionate thing. It's uh, steel and stone and concrete and hammering and smashing and all type of... Uh, vibrations and everything. So it's a very passionate sound. It's very dangerous. Easily you can fall off. In fact, even in the Vedas, they called it Raj mystery. They called it the the uh, art, uh, the craftsmen for the kings because only kings would build such big palaces and forts and things like that. But he said that, uh, so for our devotional, own personal, we don't need such a big opulent facility. We can sit in a grass hut by the side of the Ganges, Jamuna, and chant Hare Krishna. That's all we need. But who will come? Who will come to see Krishna? You see, for preaching, we need to have a nice facility. If you have a nice temple room, you know, well painted, nicely decorated, the deities are very opulently presented. Naturally, for the Kanishta Adhikaris and for neophyte people, new people are coming, it's much more attractive. They are not at that level that they can experience Krishna without the visual and other environments, you see. When you're on a very elevated platform of Krishna consciousness, that you, uh, just through the philosophy, through your own devotional service, you can feel the presence of Krishna constantly. But for the people of the material world, they need some more uh, backup. They need visual. They need all their senses to be absorbed in Krishna. They can't just, uh, by chanting alone, at that initial state, they're not able to totally fix their mind. They have so many other supports are needed. So for preaching, therefore we have, he said, for preaching we're building this up. And it works. We're getting now thousands and thousands of people coming to see the deities. <clears throat> so then Prabhupada said that you should use these facilities for preaching. Don't think that the facilities are for your comfort. You should use the facilities for serving Krishna. Therefore, traditionally those devotees... Uh, who are living in society, they keep one standard because just as the Rupa and Sanata, naturally they, as a minister, they have a certain position in society. To do their ministerial duties, if they'd come into the courtroom of the king, you know, wearing a Staharinam Chad or something like that, you know, probably wouldn't, uh, you know, give the right impression. I mean, they probably had to go, I'm sure they went in all ceremony, you know, as a minister they they kept their air, they had their facilities. Otherwise all these materialistic, uh, greedy people working under them, you know, they're not they're so uh, philosophical that uh, they see a, someone come in with a certain power, with a certain stature, they're going to take notice of that. 
Similarly, if someone's a business person, right, you have to wear a suit and tie, you have to, in the West, you have to have a certain bearing, otherwise people don't, they think you're, you're a bum or something, or they, don't, they don't, just don't, can't relate with you. So, according to each occupation, you see, they may have a certain uh, way they carry, but traditionally, those who are living in the temple communities, they live very simply as brahmanas, their duties are more as brahmanas serving the deity, preaching, and so on. So they accept voluntarily some austerity. And people can accept that. They don't expect to see people living in a religious community to be very opulent. But that doesn't mean that we don't make Krishna's worship very opulent. He can be very, very opulent because he's the Lord. So we give him big helmets and uh, thrones and jewelry and everything like that. We offer him opulent prashanam. If he leaves any on the plate, we also take. Yes? According to the Bhakti Ratnakar, Sri Chaitanya Das, the father of Srinivasacharya, once accompanied his guru, who is, I believe, Yadavacharya, or Yadunandan Acharya, one of those exalted Vaishnavas. <coughs> associates of Lord, later to become associates of Lord Chaitanya, or the guru of some of Lord Chaitanya's associates. He happened to go and uh, in the Bhakti Ratnakar it reveals the secret that how is it possible when you have this ferocious Mohammedan ruler the Hussein Sahib sometime would even go in a recess and break down the Hindu temples. How is it that Navadweep was the center of Vedic culture for the entire India at that time. It's like a kind of a mystery. Under the patronage or under the empire of uh, a Muhammad emperor, of course the local king was a uh, Hindu king, but the empire was under the Hussein Shah and he was absolute emperor. Gaudeshwar. How is it possible that in the whole India, even even from South India they are coming, from Kashmir they are coming, everywhere they are coming to Navadvip at that time, it was the seat, you see, uh, for Vedic studies at that time, Sanskrit studies. So the secret was that Rupa and Sanatan, they were giving profuse, profuse donations to all of the Brahmanas. It said that practically it was like ants going to the, or bees going, you know, to the, to the flower, to the honey pot. Is a string of brahmanas <laughs> always going up to sing. And Rupa and Sanatan would regularly in their court, they would have Bhagavatam being read and brahmanas would come up and they'd be giving donation. As a regular daily morning, uh, practice before they'd go to the king's, uh, to the emperor's uh, palace and do their uh, <coughs> court duties. Because, and that is accounted historically in the Bhakti Ratnakar because he described to Srinivas how he was asking, tell me about Rupa and Sanatan. Do you know them? Have you met them? And he said, well, I went with my guru one time and he went there and they gave a big donation to him. for, And he described all these things, how there were Bhagavatam lectures were going on, different brahmanas were chanting mantras and so they'd have their like morning Bhagavatam class, we give donation, and then they go. We don't find you know those history that we only get from the only two place I found that was the Bhakti Ratnakar. Kind of give the inner what was going on before, but they said that's like the actual secret of how Navadip was being supported by their generosity. This is be this was uh, yeah but this was before Lord Chaitanya figured into their see, Lord Chaitanya came much later he after he took sannyas he went down to Puri on his way to Vrindavan he went up so so that means 24 years of his life was in Navadip then he went to Puri then he went to South India right then after his coming back from South India then he went to Jagannath to Vrindavan isn't that or did he first go to Vrindavan. I think first he went to South India, then he went to Vrindavan. So you can say, 
in the latter part, as I have to study, it's, uh, because it does not uh, told exactly always in chronological.